Hi, I'm Henry Segerman. Hi, I'm Saul Schleimer. And I'm Dave Backman. We've been exploring these images, which we call cohomology fractals. These are similar in some ways to classic fractals like the Mandelbrot set, but in other ways they are very different. Each of these fractals is made from a different three-dimensional hyperbolic manifold. The names of these manifolds are down in the bottom right corner. This is all running on the web, so you can explore these for yourself. There's a link in the description, you can go there now and play with it, or you can follow along as we explain how these fractals are made. There are thousands of different manifolds in the web app, and thousands of corresponding fractal images. We put together a zoom through a selection of these fractals in another video. Again, there's a link in the description. OK, next I'll tell you how the web app works. The controls are WASD to rotate and the arrow keys to move. And then there's a drop down menu up here, which has lots of options that you can play with. Unlike fractals such as the Mandelbrot set, we can zoom in arbitrarily far in real time in almost any direction. We can also pan, rotate, and much more. And this all happens in real time on the GPU. This is because unlike the Mandelbrot set, our fractals are based on three dimensional spaces. So the controls are actually letting you fly around in the space and explore. However, these spaces loop around on themselves. So you often find yourself back where you started. And of course, whenever you do, you see the same thing. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's try to explain what these images are showing and what cohomology has to do with them. Let's start with a simple example and work our way up to what's going on in the app. First, we need a torus. That's just the surface of a donut. We're going to pretend that that's our whole world. And we're going to decorate it with a red loop and a blue loop. We're going to be standing right here and think about what happens as we look around, remembering that since this is our whole universe, light rays are bending with the surface of the torus. If we look in this direction, we'll first see the red loop. Light rays will continue around the torus, and then we'll see the back of our head and if we keep looking further, we'll see the red loop again. If we look in this direction, we'll see the blue loop, the back of our head, and then we'll see the blue loop again as we keep going. Our experience of this world is identical to if we were living on a plane where we see a whole set of blue lines, a whole set of red lines, and many copies of ourself. If we're here and we look in one direction, we'll see a blue line and then the back of our head and a blue line and the back of our head, etc. If we look in the other direction, we'll see red lines and other copies of ourself. Now suppose you have a magical film that when you look through it one way, say this way, the things behind it are darker, but when we look through it the other way, the things behind it get lighter. Now let's suppose that the blue loop is made out of this magical film. So what would you see as you look around? It's maybe easier to think in the, this sort of plane of things that you can see rather than the torus itself. We call this plane the universal cover of the torus. And let's suppose that you're here. Um, and suppose also that you're only going to see out some distance. Right? So maybe I'm going to see out this, this far. This is my, my visual circle. And as you look through the blue film this way, it gets darker. And as you look through the blue film this way, it gets lighter. So around you, you're going to see it getting darker in sort of bands going out this direction, and lighter in bands as you go out that direction. And if you increase the radius of this visual circle, you'd see pretty much the same, except that it would get even darker over on this right side, and even lighter over here on the left side. As we've seen, you can unwrap the donut, the torus, and get a plane. In a similar fashion, you can wrap up a square and get the boundary of the donut, the torus. Here's the square. And the first thing we do is we glue the left side to the right side to get a cylinder. Now we're going to glue the top, which is open, to the bottom, which is open, and we'll get the promised donut. In a similar fashion, you can glue up a cube. I have one here. So what I do is I glue the top face to the bottom face and the left face to the right face. Uh, OK, it's a little easier to think of this spatially. When I glue the top face to the bottom face, if we think of doing that to the room, then I'm going to glue the ceiling to the floor. I'm going to glue the front face, the, where you are, to the back face, the blackboard. And I'm going to glue the left wall to the right wall. That way, if I walk off the left wall, I can walk back in through the right wall. Pretty neat. 
Okay, let's continue the analogy. Here's the cube again. The blue loop in the torus becomes a blue wall. The universal cover becomes a three-dimensional space tiled by cubes with blue planes. You see dark looking in one direction and light looking in another. The setup in the web app is almost the same as for the three torus, except that we swap out the three torus with a different space. In the web app, the grid of cubes becomes the slices of tetrahedra. So to get to this mode where you can see these tetrahedra, um, so what I did is I switched from the cohomology mode to the distance mode here, and I also increased the edge thickness. So you can play with this to play with how thick the edges of the tetrahedra are drawn. The blue wall gets replaced by this surface. Let me turn the edges off so you can see it better. And here the camera is sort of cutting through the surface. Unlike the flat plane that we got before, this surface gets very, very squiggly off in the distance. That's because the manifold in the app has hyperbolic geometry, unlike the three torus, which has flat Euclidean geometry. Take a look at my video on non-Euclidean virtual reality. The link is in the description for a little bit more on three-dimensional hyperbolic geometry. The code for that app is very similar to the code for this simulation here. Here I've lined up the camera so that the plane of the screen goes through the surface. You can see it cutting through here. And if I increase the elevation slider, these are the sort of parallel copies of the surface which get put in just as we did for the three torus. And just as we did for the three torus, when you look through the surface in one direction, it gets darker in the cohomology view. And if you look through in the other direction, it gets lighter. So if I switch from distance to cohomology, you can see it's darker over here on the bottom and lighter over here on the top. So if I turn off the elevations, then you just see uh, through the surfaces rather than the light rays getting stopped at the surface. And this is all that it is. This is all that these cohomology pictures are showing. So another way to understand what's going on is to play with this slider, the screen distance slider. So if I move it to the left and to the right, it's changing the radius of the visual sphere. So here, way over on the left, we see these uh, sort of very big patches of color. And what we're seeing is the visual sphere cutting through individual tetrahedra. So this region in here is, uh, I guess, one or two uh, tetrahedra. And the, the color change is because um, the copies of the surface are on the uh, faces of the tetrahedra. And then as I increase the screen distance, you can see that the pattern sort of resolves, it gets sort of blurry, and then sort of around here, uh, 2.1, 2.2 or so on this screen, you get this sort of very nice sharp uh, fractal picture. This 3D printed sculpture is a depiction of the visual sphere in hyperbolic space, as seen from the outside. Part of the sphere has been cut away by one copy of the surface, which you can see on the inside colored in red. Note how the surface folds back on itself, making its boundary very complicated. The remainder of the sphere has been colored by the cohomology fractal determined by the surface. Hi, thanks again for watching. Since you've made it this far, you're obviously very interested in what cohomology fractals actually are. Let me try and say. First of all, we start with cohomology. We have a manifold, say a three manifold, and we have its universal cover, looks suspiciously similar. And we tile the universal cover by little fundamental domains. Each one of these cop, uh, covers exactly once the original manifold. If we have a loop, maybe alpha, inside the original manifold, then that lifts to give us some loop, some not loop, some arc in the universal cover. And if we have two loops in the three manifold, then we can lift one and then the other and get a longer path in the universal cover. This is like addition of loops. Okay? So a cohomology class is a function from loops to, say, the real numbers, which has two important properties. The first property is it obeys this addition. If you take two loops, alpha and beta, and concatenate them in this way, then the cohomology class evaluated on the two loops, the sum, has to be the sum of the evaluations. That's the first important property. The second property is harder to describe. Suppose that we have inside of our three manifold a loop that bounds a surface. So this is a three-dimensional manifold. 
So the manifold can contain surfaces, and those surfaces may have boundary. This loop right here, that loop is not supposed to count. The cohomology is always supposed to give 0. So uh, second property, f of delta equals 0 if delta is the boundary of a surface. OK, so that's what cohomology classes are. They're functions on loops which spit out numbers. How do we get a cohomology class? Well, that's not so bad. Here's our, surf here's our three manifold again. And here is a surface which is not separating the three manifold, like so. So here's this surface. If we lift up to the universal cover again, then this surface is going to unwrap, and it's going to become some collection of surfaces, quite possibly a very complicated collection of surfaces. So what we do is any time we have a path in the universal cover, we can see how many times it meets these surfaces and count with sign. So if we have a loop downstairs here, one, two, and then back, like so, notice that it went through the surface positive once, positive again, and then negative once. So this loop would be evaluated to plus one. In other words, anytime you have a surface in the manifold, you get a cohomology class by counting the number of intersections. So here in the universal cover, we'd go uh, positive once and then like so, something like that. Right? So we get a function on loops to real numbers by seeing how many times we crash through the surface. And so finally, here's the last step. Here's our three manifold again. And now I'll draw the visual sphere of radius r, what we do is we take a pixel inside that visual sphere, we draw the straight line from the center of the visual sphere to that pixel, and we count how many times, we count how many times it goes through the surface with sign. And that's how you get the cohomology fractal on the visual sphere. Now, why is it, that explains what it is, but it doesn't explain why it's a fractal. That's a more complicated story, and basically, the answer is due to work of Thurston following the work of many others like Alforce, Bears, Marsden. The surface that you start with in the three manifold can be one of three kinds. It can be a Fuchsian surface, it can be a quasi Fuchsian surface, or it can be what's called a doubly degenerate surface. And these three different kinds of services give you sort of three different kinds of fractals. Here, I think that's enough for an outro, don't you, Henry? Thanks for watching. All of the curves in the pattern are round circles, which are meeting sort of tangentially. Here, you'll see a beautiful pattern of sort of wiggly circles. They're kind of fractal circles, but they're not really very wild fractals. And here, you'll see a pattern where each circle actually fills up the entire sphere. It's called a sphere filling curve. Why does this happen? Ah. That's due to work of Cannon and Thurston. They showed that in the fibered case, when the manifold is actually a surface bundle over the circle, then the fiber surface always gives you one of these doubly degenerate curves. So you lift to the universal cover, some picture sort of like this, and then what I drew here was sort of a wiggly curve. But in this case,